Well, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to everyone who is tuning in right now. Um, I'm Melody Brown Birkins. I'm the director of the Institute of Arctic Studies in the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth. We are based in Hanover, New Hampshire. And the Institute of Arctic Studies at the Dickey Center is Dartmouth's crossroads for multidisciplinary Arctic scholarship and policy dialogues that center inclusion, justice, equity, and indigenous knowledge in solutions to both Arctic and global challenges. And I want to note before we begin that Dartmouth is located on the traditional and unceded homelands of the Western Abenaki peoples, part of the Wabanaki Confederacy of Indigenous peoples across this region. The word Wabanaki may be translated roughly as people of the first light or people of the dawnland. I have the distinct pleasure and honor in serving as your moderator today for a discussion of Arctic youth and film for the North American Arctic Speaker Series, which is a joint project of Dartmouth and the U.S. Department of State. It is co-hosted by our Institute of Arctic Studies here in the Dickey Center, as well as the Office of the U.S. Art Coordinator for the Arctic Region at the State Department. We launched this series last summer, and given its strong support, we hope to have several more of these dialogues throughout 2024. The purpose of the series is simply to recognize the importance of this distinct region in the North American Arctic, a region spanning Northern Alaska, the Yukon, the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, and Greenland. And we call together voices so that others may learn about the region, connect to North American Arctic knowledge systems, and build greater understanding and networks across the Arctic. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our impressive guests. We may still be waiting on one, uh, Alec Edwardson. So I'm going to move to introducing Nyla Inuksuk. She is a filmmaker, producer, and comic book mm -hmm. writer based out of Toronto, Canada. She co-created the teenage superhero Snow Guard, a member of Marvel's Champions League with her friend Jim Sub. Inuk Sook's first feature, Slashback, is a science fiction adventure about a group of 14-year-old girls from a remote Arctic community who take on an alien invasion. The film premiered at South by Southwest in March of 2022. Trapped, a short horror film shot specifically for a 24K resolution, seven foot high, 270 degree screen, premiered at the 2022 Venice Biennale. Inuk Sook is currently developing a second feature with her writing partner, Ryan Cavan, set to film in 2024. I also have on the screen for you, uh, Mr. Inuk Kriegel. Creel, sorry about that, Minutek, is that he is a photojournalist and videographer, as well as a colleague of mine with whom I'm, I was honored to work last summer in Greenland. He was born in Asiat in northern Greenland and raised in Nuuk. Receiving his first camera at age 17, Inutek studied journalism at the University of Greenland and took a semester to focus on international photojournalism. Since then, he has exhibited his photography in six different countries and taken part in book releases. In 2013, he created a black and white portrait series of people from Greenland titled 13 with Philip Kjelda. In 2014, he was one of six Greenlandic photograph photographers published in a book, Isit Takunitut. Uh, he then worked with Bobby Lowe Productions in 2019 and 2020 as a photographer and videographer and continues to take on creative photojournalism and film projects in Greenland and beyond. And when, if and when we have uh, Alok uh, Edwardson join us, she is, I will just do a quick introduction that she is a filmmaker, actor, playwright, director, singer, novelist, and entrepreneur who was born and raised in Northern Alaska on the shores of the Arctic Ocean. And she is the founder and director of Creative Decolonization, LLC, with work support, uh, focused on supporting wellness, cultural explorations, and creative engagements in service to Arctic communities and families around the world. And we will get to her again uh, if and when she's able to join us. But for now, let me, with these incredible folks I have with me, it is my honor uh, to start uh, a few questions and, and really learn from you over the next 45 minutes to an hour. And I'm going to start with you, Nyla, if that's all right. Um, sure. My first question for you, and uh, I'm going to have, if you want to recap anything I said about your introduction, please feel free. But my first question, oh, gosh. <laughs> no? you like that? That was good. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hopefully I got it. So you all bring um, years of experience to the practice of making and films and writing and directing and engaging your audiences in the Arctic and around the world by thoughtfully and intentionally telling stories of Arctic communities and of Arctic youth through your films, plays, writings, music, photojournalism, and digital media. May I ask you to share 
how you got to where you did, your career path, and then what drives you as an Arctic artist, creator, and producer? What is it? What drives you to make these films and tell these stories and narratives with and for Arctic peoples and around the world? Nyla, first. Sure, thank you. Um, I think the answer to both is kind of the same, like what got me in and what drives me in a way is I, I'm a bit of a nerd. I really like movies and scary movies and, and VR and AR and interactive stuff. And um, I've kind of, you know, when I was younger, I, I loved horror movies. Uh, I think, um, uh, and, and I would make, and I've always kind of made, made things with, with people I really like and my friends and, and that's part of it, I think too. Um, I, uh, you know, my mom loves scary movies too. She loves Hitchcock. I think I watched the birds when I was, well, I know I was way too young. I was eight years old and that's like the same age as those kids that are getting like pecked at, you know, halfway through. But I think there was also something about, like thrilling about doing something that kind of feels like you're getting away with something. Um, and it's also what I, you know, come to kind of, as I, as I start to really, I mean, I'm, I do question how much I should be spending thinking about fear and anxieties. And, but I do think that it is a way, a safe way to process some of these, these feelings and, and certainly for me with, with making new projects and working through scripts, it's a way for me to just process how I'm feeling about things. Uh, so um, I kind of got started, my brother actually, he broke his leg when I was in high school and he was really into snowboarding and skateboarding. So this was devastating for him. And so my parents got him this like handicap and I, and so that he could still be hanging out with his friends and be doing something. And, uh, and then I ended up just like using, getting my cousins drenched in blood and making them hang out in graveyards and stuff and filming them. And, and then I was really lucky because I, uh, I went to a, a school district that had these programs where you could transferred to a different high school for one semester. It was these called these focus programs and you could just focus on one specific thing and it could be radio or theater. And they had a, they had a filmmaking one. And so in the mornings you just um, learned about film theory and that sort of thing. And then in the afternoons you had access to these HD video cameras, which were brand new and, and computers with Final Cut Pro uh, editing software and just encouraged to make things. And so a lot of people kind of got by with doing nothing, but me and my friends, like we just like made the stupidest, silliest movies, which was, you know, just, you know, it, it was so silly, but we got a sense of uh, how to tell a story by, you know, what you can hear and see and, and uh, putting those pieces together. Um, and then, and that actually gave me the encouragement to go to, uh, to film school. And so I, I studied film in college and, and then started working at a, a production company pretty soon after I graduated, um, that was owned by an indigenous woman. And so that was just like this amazing opportunity for me to see just how a, a company like that could run. And, and she had her, you know, the, all these indigenous employees and, um, just making, making cool stuff and making stuff for TV and, and making movies and documentaries. And it just kind of gave me a sense of what was possible. Oh, thank you so much. I hear the drive. It's right. It's still there. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Um, in no tech, what, what, how did your career path end up in this space? Well, I was, I was 17. I, I went to the States as a foreign exchange student when I was 17. Um, I, then before I left, my father gave me a camera. And that's the first time I had a camera in my life. So it was, I was like playing with it for the whole year while I'm in the States. So all those pictures. I think that kind of gave me um, something that I found interesting to start with. Then I started with, with gymnasium. And when you start with gymnasium, you're a big bunch of young people. And very early on, you get to be you kind of find your group 
and my group of friends has always been the the filmmakers, the musicians, and all those kind. So I think my friend group in the gymnasium, in the three years of gymnasium, actually, um, is is the reason why I came into this because I had a classmate who was who's was a Whose uh, whose father takes a lot of photos, so he was he has learned from his father, then I could learn from him. So it all all started from there, and it and because of that group, who uh, who want to try different paths all the time and to be creative in any way in music, in in art, in in photography, in filmmaking, I think um, in those years, everyone. Um, just supported each other on whatever they're doing, and that's that made me more interested in photography and more, more interesting and interesting in filmmaking. And because of that, that's also one of the reasons why I chose journalism. Because here uh, you can study uh, photography or filmmaking here in Greenland, but uh, journalism is the one thing that is closest. So I thought that was be a good opportunity to learn. Um, to choose journalism so I can do filmmaking and photo photography on the side while studying here in Greenland in my own native, native language. So that's what I did. Which um, I think the drive has always been those in our youth uh, and all those group of people we met and what we did all the, we arranged festivals, music festivals, underground music festivals. We were making, using a lot of hours just to make short films that I've never, uh, been published <laughs> so, so so I think that's uh, those three four years of that um, how do you call it creativity without borders we had together is one of the reasons why I choose the path that I'm working with today thank you um, so it's it's uh, it sounds for both of you the drive was innate and then you had to find places that it was uh, supported and created, and I'll have a question on that if we get to it later in the uh, later in our our conversation. But before then, I was going to um, ask you that you each work in distinct regions of the Arctic. Um, I think uh, that said, you also probably work all over the world in different spaces. But when we're talking about uh, the the farthest north, uh, the Arctic spaces of Greenland and, uh, and Nunavut and and northern Canada. Um, they each have distinct communities and histories. And do you have, either of you, I'm gonna start with you, Nyla, do you have any favorite stories from a region in which you've worked or you grew up um, that speaks to how the voices of youth can be engaged themselves? So take the, potentially, if they have a spark that you had, that drive that you had, how could they get engaged in film or digital media in some way? Um, and is there a story, you, you might maybe have a story of, of someone you know doing that work? Nyla first. Yeah, yeah, maybe, I'll, okay, I'll tell two stories that can kind of, well, the, I feel like um, one story that kind of I thought is funny about just, um, I think, youth and tech and uh, the when I, I worked a lot with young people on Slashback, my first feature, which is this scripted movie, but we worked a lot with the kids when we were developing the script as well, my co-writer and I. And uh, I think that, you know, that's why the, the kids kind of engaged with the script and it kind of felt like it was reflective of them in that way. Um, but <clears throat> And so we're, we kind of spent a bunch of time with them. And then, you know, the movie comes out and I was talking to some people here in Canada, just doing press and, and someone asked me or just said, it was really cool how you chose to make the girl so modern. And it, um, I kind of like, it took me back for a second. It, cause you know, of course I, I never, it never occurred to me to make a, a period piece uh, <laughs> of, of this, but also it was just, I think that people had never really seen um, Inuit young people with like Instagram. And it's this idea that, you know, just because they live in these remote places, they still listen to Justin Bieber and all of these things. Um, and so it was, uh, that was kind of just one thing that um, I, that was just, you know, when I'm, when I'm hanging out with these kids, there's oftentimes so much more 
um, adept at the technology than I am. Um, and they really love kind of, you know, being uh, playing around with those kinds of new emerging um, technology trends and, and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, it, I, I think that also one thing is that about the distinctness of the different communities. Um, there is one project that I'm working on right now with documentary that is taking place in a very specific community. And it is one that I, I think I, it's one that is close pro, in close proximity to this big archaeological discovery. <laughs> I'll just say that. And um, the, uh, the, there's a documentary that I was asked to make, but this, um, but it was important that it be coming from the community perspective. And me being an Inuk that is, you know, family from Igloolik, but kind of raised in Halloween and then living in Toronto, it. I am clearly not from this community and, and it's also very like, it's uh, um, the, the kind of, in order to have this understanding, I needed to be working with someone from the community. So it was really important in this first research trip to find a co-writer and co-director to just be um, my partner in all aspects, creative and otherwise. And um, and uh, we found this really fantastic person. And so we've been working for the last few months together. Um, and it's just been so uh, important this, um, I think in working with, with communities that might have um, limited access to certain things for whatever reason, it's just to understand that there is this knowledge exchange that's happening. And I think we're used to kind of coming in with um, with this th this idea from the south in in the in no what we call everywhere that's not the Arctic the south, um, so it's like if pe people from the south come in, it's the the, ex the exchange is usually one sided, and I think it's just like really important obviously to both sides are equally valuable and there is an exchange in e of equal value happening. Um, and so that's just kind of, I mean, the, the biggest kind of lesson, but also um, movies are, this movie making is collaborative. You can't, it, that's, it's a collaborative sport and that's what makes it great too. Um, so uh, the working within indigenous, with, within indigenous communities, sometimes the collaboration just has to, has to look different. Thank you. That's a, it's, it's a, in our first uh, speaker series on issues of uh, uh, energy transitions and climate, this is going to be a theme that comes through and I hope through all the world, but I do appreciate that when we go into communities, uh, if we're not from that community, how much we need to partner and have those knowledge exchanges, it's sort of very first. And I will turn because, this is what Inutik and I worked together on, and he helped me quite a bit, and I did everything wrong, and thank you for my corrections. <laughs> but please, uh, you, do you have any stories from your own work as well in Greenland? Yes, um, I just find it really interesting that you mentioned all these things, um, um, Isla, because that's also one of the things I work with as a journalist here in, uh, here in Greenland, because I am, I am freelancing, I am working with a lot uh, so a lot of the photographers, uh, videographers that come to Greenland, especially from Europe, um, they tend to like, uh, I'll, I'll always try to be their first person to go to. I don't, don't necessarily have to necessarily don't have to like, um, work with them. Um, but not necessarily had to work with them closely, but, uh, I always make sure that they're not, <laughs> I, that they're not, um, um, we have had problems with journalism from Europe uh, coming to Greenland with already pre-made uh, stories about how the thing should be. So I'll uh, just to make sure that uh, we don't end up in the same, that's telling the same story about our majestic nature and our suicide rates, <laughs> and then they're gonna yeah. go go back to Europe again. So I'm I'm always trying to be the first person that they talk to, so I can go through all these things that all the journalists have done wrong or maybe should have done differently. So it's like even though um, mostly do this for free in a way, but I'm I, I'd rather do this as just to protect in in a way um, my own country 
from out from mm -hmm. I should call them par parachute journalists and par parachute yeah. journalism. Yeah. No, it's um, uh, it's it's an I feel like that's um very common and and until we kind of are just given the freedom and I think and we're you know we're really getting there to tell our own stories, um, then and really trusted to tell our own stories then um uh and yeah. also and also and also it's a common thing now that now people are coming from other countries and forcing us to tell our own story if it makes sense so it also comes in yeah. in, in in two layers that now like now, now we're going to do something good now we're going to let them tell the story but it's still it's still constructed not by us in what way so it's also something that we exactly. have to discuss more because it, it doesn't get discussed in that layer if you ask me enough That's... yeah definitely. um thank you thank you both and i'm going to bring in uh a, a quick i gave you a little introduction i look that you didn't have for so good to see you um and uh i will do a quick introduction that alok is uh talking with us from Alaska, and that's actually my home state as well, but she, you were born much further north, and she's also a Dartmouth alumna, um, and uh, I mentioned that you are many things you've done, but I will also mention that uh, Alec founded, I mentioned uh, Creative Decolonization, which is a collaborative space to build community-driven creative projects, supporting cultural and individual wellness, and many different projects you can find if you go to her website that she's done in writing, in film, in directing, in music, um, and we were just talking, we just were talking about um, some stories about sense of place and the people with whom we work. And I, uh, in the Arctic, I think the uh, Nyla was, and both uh, Nyla Kanuatek were mentioning how um, there are some challenges with sometimes preconceptions. And again, we were, you just heard uh, folks telling your story or asking you to tell your story potentially in a, in a certain framework. So to try to stay away from that, I will open up for Alec for you to mention just a little bit about how maybe how you like uh, a, a story that you have um, from your region that you um, want to put forward as why film and digital media are so important to the future of Arctic youth. Definitely. Thank you for having me. I apologize. I'm late. I'm on native time. Um, yeah, born and raised in northern Alaska. And so, um, oh, excuse me about that. Um, so, so yeah, the, the story that I've actually been working with for about 10 years, um, I, I bet you Inutech and Nyla know it. I don't like calling it the Sedna story because that's not our word for her. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that. Sedna was a different word. I don't even know where it came from. Um, but uh, where where I come from, um, we call her Neyalik. Neyalik. Um, and so she has a lot of different names, but she's the mother of the deep. Um, she has a really tragic story in some ways, but a story about rebirth. And it, it's it's a story that I think a lot of youth, I did just turn that off. <laughs> um, and so that a lot of youth are drawn to because it's about a young girl. It's about um, a girl of marriageable age that refuses to get married. So she, she shows some independence there. Um, and she has some really um, traumatic things happen to her fingers, but out of that trauma comes the birth of all of the ocean animals. And so I really am tied to that story, and I've been working on that story for about a decade now in different formats and play formats and um, novel format um, so that I can we can talk about um, that independence so that we can talk about the ties that she has to her family that brought that tried to bring her back home, but also talk about um, how trauma can is not just trauma, because where I come from and I'm at, and I, I, I know this is true all over the Arctic, there's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of pain. And so I'm really interested in bringing those stories of pain and those stories of um, loss into the forefront of our youth's lives um, and, and so that they can they can talk about that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to uh, move to, well, actually, this, this that's a very good segue, actually. It is that as we talk about these ways to, for uh, narratives and storytellings that you have all devoted your lives to, um, and you are, I can say you're a younger generation because I'm definitely a bit older than all of you. Um, but as you think about these next generations of, of Arctic 
um, filmmakers, storytellers, and creators, and how they might want to bring their ideas, um, potentially inspired by some of your work as well, um, when they want to bring these forwards, how, what are some guidance you might give to them about seeking out experiences or programs um, to, to find, to help their voice and their, 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 their uh, pers perspectives on the future of the Arctic, to bring those to life, not just for other Arctic communities, but really for the world. I know it's a big ask, but um, I'll start actually with you again, Nyla, if you have an idea of how you would might advise a next generation who comes to you with these <laughs> ideas. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I think the most important thing is just to try to, to try making things. And even if, you know, I mean, a cell phone and a computer with iMovie, that is a lot, but maybe you can like, if you don't have it, maybe you can borrow somebody's, but you can be like making things and learning how to kind of, you know, record sound separately and pair it with, I mean, I'm talking specifically about movies, but then even beyond that, if you're wanting to have an idea, maybe you've made some short films and you're wanting to do something else, it's, 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 if you've got this great idea and you want to make a feature film and, but you've got this access to resources to make a podcast, maybe like make a podcast fiction version and learn kind of it, these kinds of things can ex explore the story in a different space um, and then use that as a proof of concept and sell it to Netflix or something or do whatever you want. Like you don't have to sell it, make it within your community. And it's like the, there are so, and that's the other important thing that it's, there's so many different ways to make things and make movies. Hollywood isn't the only way to make movies. Um, and and we're, we're lucky in Canada that we also have public funding for, um, for the arts in, that in, in, a, in a kind of structured way. Um, but then also specifically for youth in, in Canada, um, we also can do co-productions. We, 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 can, we can do partnerships with Americans or other countries, Greenland, we can do partnerships in Greenland and get and, um, and make things together because we also share so many interesting stories and uh, histories and experiences. Um, and so finding these collaborative partnerships where you can be learning from each other and, and sharing resources. And, and then I have been spending some time in this community of Joe Haven, which is, has 1300 people. So it's smaller and it's fly in only. So you, if you're oftentimes young, some of these youth, the only time they leave is if they're going to the hospital or have to go down south or something. And so, but even there, you can go to your Hamlet office and there's, you can create a little film society or a big film society, and you can apply for funds and get resources to buy some equipment and just experiment. And, and cause, and also it's just like, you can play around and it's not be a, a career. It could just be a way to kind of, process your feelings and make cool art or something but if it's something that you feel like you're passionate about and it, that would be cool it, try it and and play around and explore and and um because it's um i think important for everyone to be able to have a creative outlet Oh gosh, you're, 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 I, I absolutely agree. And I'm going to, I'm guessing some similar answers, but I'd love to hear Inutech. What would you tell uh, some young folks in your community of, in Nuke or elsewhere that what they might do to follow your career? Yeah, I speak more on behalf from Nuke because in, in Greenland, it is very, as, as it is in, on all the Arctic regions, it's very difficult and expensive to travel from, uh, from place to place. So I speak more on behalf of Nuke uh, because I, I've, I'm in, based in Nuuk, I've been working in Nuuk. But the first thing I can mention is that the Film GL is an interest or organization with all the filmmakers uh, have uh, met together in, in Greenland and making like an interest organization where you can gather all those people who work with the films. And because of that, that's where the Nuuk Film Festival has started, which has uh, been uh, a photographer for, for some years. And also, uh, and uh, when you think about youth, uh, because of film GL's work, uh, f a few years ago they started the call uh, something called Film Miljoptafik here in Nuuk, which is the film workshop place where they actually have two uh, filmmakers working in an office every day where every kid is welcome to use 
all the equipment there is and all those computers there is. And it is um, it is a pilot project in some ways. It's been running for some years now, but it is still going strong. And that's um, I know that there's a, a bunch of young people, a film interesting people that that it's actually um, uh, hangs there a lot because they have all these possibilities to get those expensive cameras, expensive uh, uh, editing pro programs, and they do all sorts of different workshops. It is so I'm pretty sure what they're doing right now, if they uh, if they're expanding as they've been doing, I think it's uh, it's going to be really good for the Greenlandic film community to start with. But it is here in Nuuk to start with. There's nothing like that in different places. But what's the name of it again? Film uh, And uh, if if you go to film.gl. You can find that yeah. uh, the, the um, you can find all those those people, and it's because of Film GL yeah. that the film festival has been started, and also Film Milio mm. And also in that aspect, because I talked with all those be, be, before this webinar, I talked with a lot uh, uh, different filmmakers about this, and one thing they mentioned is that uh, when we first got our first home rule in '79, the film industry wasn't really big. So it was really not accounted for when they made budgets. Uh, as as of course with theater and music, they got all those different money, but the filmmaking has been forgotten in what way in our in our uh, the finances of our country, how you call with funding and everything. So it's what Film GL has been working for for the past few years, just to get like to be um, to see filmmaking as a way of living because it's always been something that you do on the side project here in Greenland. So that's for the first time uh, here this year in Future Greenland, which is a big conference that's going to be held in Nuuk, there's going to be a representative, and represent, uh, there's one, uh, Emil Perona is going to represent the film industry and having a speech about having a filmmaking as a way of living in Greenland. So we're slowly going there where we actually get acknowledged for what we do because there's so many young filmmakers and filmmakers and all that have hard time living off it because many people don't consider it as a way of living, a way of like uh, earning for a living. I think we're on a good path, but it's still, there's still some, some ways uh, to get up there. Thank you. And uh, Alok, I'll go to you. I do the, the having those kinds of support networks was actually going to be my next question, but I'll keep going on this one. And uh, Alok, what do you think um, when you have young folks come to you and you are hoping to get into this space and looking for support? Uh, does Alaska or the United States are there places where there are some supports that you would suggest, or maybe things that you do yourself? Yeah, there's a couple points. Um, one, yeah, there's a there's actually quite a few opportunities. We don't have any state funded programs or anything, but there's a lot of private funding, um, and there's a lot of organizations within Alaska and within the country that support Native arts, which is really exciting. And you can apply. I've been um, I've I've been a fund I, I've been a fundee from um, um, you know some some of these organizations across the country over the years. And so that's how I've done some of my work. But I also want to point out that not, a, not all of our students, not all of our young people want to engage in a program like that. A lot of the young people that I talk to, because I come from a very remote village, um, you have to fly into and fly out of. Um, also, I need to... I, I did turn my chat off. I apologize. It's just keeping going. But um, Nulieok, I my mouth was funny earlier. Nulieok, for anybody listening, that's that's the name we have in Alaska for her. Um, um, Sasana Arna is also another one that might have heard in Greenland. Um, and so, and the Canada ones, I can't even pronounce for her name, um, but um, <laughs> um, they're just different. But so I would suggest um, for the people that want to stay home, because there's a lot of people that want to stay home and I respect that. They don't want to travel. They're not interested in going to the city to do these things. Um, I would suggest connecting with their, um, their local um, colleges, whether it's distance college or, or whether it's um, in person. I taught for five years as a um, a professor, an adjunct professor in the New Park Studies program 
for Ili Salavi College. And um, I worked with hundreds of students that were very interested in art. And I found that the the online space that a lot of these colleges have these days for students to do film or even um, writing, which is what I specialize in, or performance you can do even online these days, is a really good outlet for people that want to stay home. Um, the other thing I think to point out is bandwidth. So um, Inutech and I come from areas that don't have great internet and a lot of people don't have internet. It's expensive. Um, and, you know, nowhere in Alaska do I know of that's, you know, you get free internet. And so I also think about that, like, so in the work that I do, um, I create videos, but I also create um, just audio, just audio for students. And I encourage students to explore that um, if they don't have um, funding or if they don't have access to um, computers or anything else like that to create their art. The other thing, as a lifelong writer, you don't need anything but a pen and paper for that. <laughs> and so, and I can talk for the next hour about the health, uh, about the spiritual, physical, and cultural benefits of writing. Um, but that is something that I, I put forward to students is if you have these emotions, because a lot of times our students, they go to art, um, yes, they're interested in a passion, but they want to release something, right? And so um, I encourage them to to write about it first. Um, so that that is um, that's what I would say for that. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. I actually have uh, there's a question I haven't um, previewed for you, but I'll get to that after the one that I did uh, send all of you, and um, that you've all mentioned. And so it, it maybe it will reiterate some of these. You've all mentioned some programs that are in place um, that support uh, support creatives, uh, create creative thinking, which is which is again um, a, a core to community, to wellness, to uh, having narratives in the voice of those who it should be the the communities and the the, the folks living these uh, in these spaces in the Arctic. Um, and I appreciate all the work that you're doing. I wonder if you you were able to say, I am in charge of funding and policy for the future of these uh, of, of of filmmaking and writing and creative spaces for youth and all of the Arctic. Are there any things that you know, sort of messages you would love to give to your governments, um, the the governments of the Arctic, the the business leaders and the community leaders of how to <laughs> listen and think about how to support um, what Inuitech was just mentioning that this is actually this is a lifestyle this is an incredibly important uh, uh, role to play in the uh, the future of thriving communities in the Arctic and around the world so how do we support that not just have it a sort of a sideline and if you ha if you could tell someone about how we can make sure these narratives and these the voices of the Arctic um, are brought through filmmaking and writing and digital media what might you ask people to do? So I'm putting you in that space, Nyla, first. Yeah, I think the uh, this project that I'm working on in this community, it's been um, really kind of exciting for me, but it's it also is in line with some stuff that has been happening in Canada and I think globally within the indigenous screen community. Um, and then also just uh, the, the this, big change in conversation about race that happened in 2020 and that has kind of shifted the way we talk about narrative sovereignty and the importance of, of racialized people to be telling their own stories. Um, and I think, uh, you know, even, even when it comes to programs, the program should be developed by the people from the community and determining the needs of uh, the, determining their needs and and also trusting that they know their own needs um, and the and that probably if you're not from there you don't and I think that that's just kind of a really big big thing that is really felt especially in these tiny communities that are so remote but relies that, that but there is you know a lot of funding within the territory to go towards programming um, that I think that it's important for the, the community members to, to realize that they can be in charge of, of, of their own programs, of, of developing, um, uh, of telling their own stories and, and they should be asking for that. Um, and I think the cool thing is that with this shift, 
we're having options now where it doesn't necessarily make sense to, if someone's coming in and saying, hey, we want to partner with you to tell your story, it's kind of like, well, why don't I just tell the story myself? I can go and, and find my partners and, and there actually are people that, and then sometimes the other person will be like, oh yeah. <laughs> and and it's, so it is, because it is a different kind of type. Sometimes they want, and they'll try and try, tell the story too. Um, but it's, but that's, I think that having the choices is, makes such a difference. Um, and in Canada, we've got this, this place called the Indigenous Screen Office that, that, and that provides funding for filmmakers to, and new media artists and podcasters and all that sort of thing to, to make things. Um, and that can kind of trigger other funding because often with these grants and stuff, there's, you know, gap in financing or, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of, um, and then also it, it, Sterling Harjo at FX, a, a big network TV show, Res Reservation Dogs, that is created and written and directed by Indigenous people, I, and so good. It's, um, I think that now it can kind of, we can say, um, we should be in charge and we can see, and, and sometimes it kind of takes that, unfortunately, to, to kind of be able to, to get that um, uh, that trust. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Inuitek, how would you build on that too? I'm just, it was, uh, as a Greenland, with my public thing with everything else, uh, from where you got many other people around the world photographers, many filmmakers, they will always be more us to come to my country and which is good, but it's also because we're so few population and so little filmmaking, we also really easy to like um how do you like um feeling that it's hundred so oh, you're cutting, you're cutting out a little bit in your tech. I'll just try again, uh, just to make sure you, we heard you. I know uh, that uh, I know uh, the problem face as it could be. It's because we're not that many. We're really we're, we, 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 we no, there's a handful do as that's not many, and that's even. In, in different times of in a way because we're so few there's a bunch of come to Greenland. We have a way to find a more um call it um stay Oh, go ahead. I'll, I, uh, your, your audio is, it's, it's clicking out just a little bit. So I will move to Alok and try to come back. Yeah. So this is a really big question and I think about it from a couple angles. So I've worked in education for a long time and I first think about that arena. I think, oh, wow, wouldn't it be nice to have more funding in education for native arts? Um, cause we really don't have that many we don't, and we don't have a lot of, but then I think about it and I think, well, our teaching staff right now is diminished and our native teachers, there's not that many. So, I mean, it's just such a big question because yes, our policymakers can allocate more funds or resources, but then we have to have the workforce, which we, we don't in education. And then, you know, you think about it in terms of, um, in terms of what um, Nyla was saying and offering more grants and opportunities. And I think that's an, that, that is, an avenue, um, but I don't really see that as a strong avenue for young people because they don't have the grant writing skills yet and it's quite daunting. And so I'd be interested in seeing an intermediary step between applying for grants. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be like grant prep because I don't see a lot of youth going to that. Um, but uh, but, but um, I've taught youth for 10 years, so I have a lot and I've taught all ages. So I, I'm like, and I love kids. Um, but um, so, so I think, I think bringing people to the table is about inviting them in a way that speaks to them. And I think that's a unique challenge specifically after 2020, because 
identity work is so complex and multifaceted. That's the work that I do in my business, creative decolonization, is I, I help people do the first step, the decolonization. And then we can do the re-indigenization after that. A lot of people try to do re-indigenization before they're decolonized or before they've done decol work. And it doesn't work. You can't, <laughs> you're gonna, you're like putting it onto something that slips. <laughs> and so um, so I think personally working on that inner work, which is something I'm passionate about with youth and something that I do to help them process what it is they want to say and what it is they want to do. And then, because who knows, you know, who knows when they're young? And I mean, I'm 37 and I still don't know sometimes. Um, and so like, you know, but um, so I think that inner work and having, I think from a policy standpoint, we can allocate more funds for artists to work, you know, part-time with youth, for instance. There are some programs that do that, but again, they're like, complicated um but again but you know working with our tribes and saying because that's actually when you when you say what do you want to, from a policy standpoint and from the government i'm like that's not my government i don't know um and so so i if you say what about your native government what about your tribal government i think there's a lot of work to be done there at least in alaska and the states to revitalize our performance our healing performance activities so a lot of people, it's interesting in Utah that you say in Greenland, um, film is slow and the other arts were first. In Alaska, it's the opposite. We had, my older sister is a, um, a critically acclaimed filmmaker, Rachel, Rachel Nuninoff Edwardson. And um, she was the first Inuit filmmaker. Um, and after her, there's like 15 now. And the, but the revitalization efforts for theater, which is what was our healing medium forever, right? Right, very, very slow. And so I would be interested in seeing more funding and resources going towards um, doing our body-based healing practices. In New Tech, I'm sorry, I, we were, it, I wanted to make sure we didn't cut uh, cut you out. I don't. I hope it, maybe it's a little better now and we missed a bit of what you were saying, or at least I did. Um, but let me see if you give me a, a quick, see if we can, if your voice is good there. I thought you did. Huh? or it's a little bit but may, we'll try it and what i was going to give I'm, you i'm going to try to take my headphones and hear of course okay <laughs> we'll see how this goes i don't know well, if, it, if it's better or not much better excellent thank you so much for trying um no. i was going to ask you uh and i think you were giving me an answer about um Again, you've already said that there there's some stepping up of the the, the government um, and others in communities in Nuuk to um, fund some of these ideas. I'm going to ask you two things. I'm going to ask you if you want to relay that again, just because of the the audio issue. But then I'm going to ask you to um, the last thing I'm going to ask you, and then I'm going to go to the other two. Is as we round out this hour. Um, could you give me a heads up on a project that you are doing over the next one or two years that you're excited about? So first, some ideas of what 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 you would ask your community, your governments to do to support this kind of work in addition to what you've already said. And then second, I'm going to prompt you on a project that you're doing, um, and then I'll move to the other two. Uh, to start off, uh, right now I'm doing smaller uh, photo projects here in photojournalistic projects with a friend. And other than that, I work as a consultant for the municipality and their culture department. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm writing a report right now on musicians and their rehearse spaces. So that's, uh, that's what I'm doing right now. But I do have other dreams uh, of a bigger project. And it's, this, this is only on um, uh, the, pre the, the phases are, right now we are in, we're still on the idea basis. But uh, my dream is to make a documentary where we travel all the different places where Inuit lives. Because last summer, last last year, I had the possibility. Uh, I was lucky enough to be a part of a festival where we had some people from uh, um, Iqaluit, uh, filmmakers and musicians from Iqaluit, uh, to to meet with them in Sisimiut with Arctic Sounds Music Festival. And because of those friendships we made over there we had some different talks about uh being inuit and being uh from different places and from three different governments which wants three different things from us in a way 
And even though we're so much alike and we're so much have uh, same humor and so many things alike, we don't know much about each other. I don't know much about all the different places. And that's, um, of course, we can talk about the people who work for ICC or work for all the different cultural things that get to travel, all those things, but they're the privileged one, privileged ones. But for all the, for all the, all us who just, uh, especially people who doesn't work with uh, art and film and music, doesn't get the possibility to meet them and to actually, to, um, how do you say it, smile, um, mirror us with each other and uh, what our differences, is, what we're, we're like. So it's something that I've been discussing with uh, different filmmakers uh, about want wanting to do. And I think this year should, I would try to get some funding for that kind of project I want to make. I think we have a good idea what we want to make, but we want to make a documentary uh, about Inuit, from Inuit to Inuit. So our, we, my, my initial plan is that we can film this and every Inuit can see it and actually get a sense of uh, history, uh, political stance right now, um, colonialism, uh, all those things, all the humor in, in different ways. So we can actually get a, how do you call it, an updated, updated info about all the different Inuits because we don't, I don't know, I know so little about all those uh, uh, different Inuits, even though we're so much alike. And that's uh, one of my dreams is to work on that, but it will come later this, this year. I'm still working on that idea. Oh, thank you so much, Inutek. I, that was wonderful to hear. Um, Nyla, something you're working on right now that you would love to tell us about, or I hope you'll, I hope you'll love to tell us about. Yeah, sure. And I think I can tell you about this other project. I was like, is it a secret? But I don't think it is. I, it's, um, uh, I'm, I also would love to hear the rest of your last answer that I missed because uh, of the, the sound thing. Um, and that documentary sounds very cool and I agree. And I think the, um, that just that thing about the humor, it's like, I feel like there is such a humor within our communities and within our games and, and so much joy and laughter. And that is just a part of us that is missing when you see it through this lens of, of um, you know, when, when you think, of, I think down South, people might see these communities as, or even I, I love that we have this Canadian pianist named Glenn Gould, and he kind of loved the Arctic, but as an idea, as this kind of like romantic kind of idea of a place of isolation and solitude and darkness. And I think if you're from the, the North, that like, I mean, the idea of solitude and isolation, I get, it's like, you can't get away from people and like it's it's very much about community and and you know what's happening with who and all of this stuff um so uh i i love that um and i, I would love to know more about the different um the the different inuit around the world and because i think that there is so much that's um that's shared and I'm working on a, a documentary with my my co-writer and co-director. Um, it's about the these ships that went missing, the Franklin expedition that it, that went missing, and they've recently been discovered. Um, I, and so this community is there's two communities very close that are co-managing the site with Car Parks Canada, so they're co-owning um, the sites and deciding what happens around them. Um, and so it's this really interesting time and exciting time. And, um, and so that's, it's, I just got back from there yesterday. Um, and I'm also making a scary movie this fall uh, about the, <laughs> the, uh, that kind of explores in a fun and scary and a bit of a tragic way, the um, uh, ethics of drawing from trauma for entertainment. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that's kind of where I'm at. Wow. I love it. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Um, Alok, what are you working on right now or in, in the next year you hope to create? Well, first, both your projects sound so amazing and I want to follow them. Um, the, the trauma one's really interesting to me. I get really frustrated by when I see, you know, how trauma is used um, just for shock and awe or for this kind of horrible stuff. It really bothers me. So that's really interesting. And, and also the Franklin expeditions, those are so fascinating um, 
real big interest in archaeology. And then Inuit Nunat, I don't know if you heard that in UTEC, if you've heard that phrase. I know quite a few people in Alaska who are very interested in that documentary. And they're filmmakers too. <laughs> so if you want to get in contact with them, I'd love to connect you. Gabe Tagosiak is the first person that comes to mind. And he's been trying to do what you're saying for probably a decade. Um, he's been wanting to bring Inuit from all over um, um, and connect in an artistic way. And he has done different projects himself. But um, so, so yeah, I, I'm definitely going to follow your projects. For me this year, um, when the new year came, I said, this is the year of the book. I hope. Um, <laughs> I've been working on this book since I was at Dartmouth in 2000. Well, I started it in 2010. Um, and uh, and I've been very slow. I'm real native in that way. Like, I don't rush. I don't. People get mad at me, but I'm like, eh, whatever. Um, and so, um, <laughs> um, so that I'm really excited about. That is a book that encompasses about 120 years of history in Northern Alaska. Um, and it, it starts with the first wave of colonization on the shores of Utkavik, where I come from. And it's actually an interesting beginning. You, you might think it was like traumatic or whatever, but it wasn't, they were friends. Um, and so it's actually what happens um, is it's the birth of um, the mother of the deep is born into this first wave of colonization and her story happens and then we move through and she's gone and we lose the last Kivik in 1910 and then we go on and we tell the story of a young man um, who was raised in the 90s from um, his father's a whaling captain and um, his father died and he deals with um, suicide and some addiction issues on the ice and so there's a real magical ending um, I won't spoil it, but it's a fantastical realism um, based on our traditional stories. So I'm really excited about this book. I've put like a decade of research into it. And it, for our Inuit, it's written for Inuit. And so there's a lot of our history in there, at least in Alaska. Um, what would be super fun is to take this story and do it with uh, Canadian and Greenlandic people in their versions of Mother of the Deep and see what stories they want to bring up because I um, I parallel the Mother of the Deep story with a modern story of a young boy, a, a, a teenage boy who's dealing with a lot of these challenges that we deal with that I dealt with in the 90s myself. Um, so that's the big project. It's done. I'm just polishing it. So I'm trying to get that published and then... Um, I, I do these creative decolonization workshops. I invite you to come. A lot of them are public and free, but they focus on cultural identity, multicultural identity, and helping people to reconnect their hurt parts to their whole parts. So, Well, my thanks to all of you. Um, we only have a few minutes left, uh, two minutes left or so. And uh, first and foremost, um, the sincere privilege to have you all on my screen uh, talking and and uh, setting setting stories straight and talking about future stories. And um, I am another privilege I hope you will take advantage of is even though we couldn't hear you a little bit in Utec, I will come back to you and we can uh, put some quotes and ideas on the uh, website uh, that will have the recording of this to make sure they're heard. And I will also, of course, I re resend all your uh, contact information to each of you because I part of the hope of this conver these conversations is really to connect you, to connect ideas and connect sharing opportunities. And if uh, the Institute of Arctic Studies at Dartmouth can be supportive and helpful of that, we are here for that too. And I know the State Department, the U.S. State Department, has really made this uh, a focus of how do we connect ideas, voices, uh, knowledge systems, and 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 uh, dreams um, of the peoples of the North American Arctic? So I can't thank you enough for your sharing, and uh, it was just an absolute pleasure. So thank you, Naila Nuksuk. Thank you, Alec Edwardson. Thank you, Nutuk Kriel. And I look forward to talking with you again. And thank you so much for being part of this today. Awesome. And thanks, thanks, guys. It was really nice. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank thanks for organizing. This was great. Bye. Bye.